Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 55 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. John Jay. We've all heard his name, but what do we really know about him? Some of us may be able to recall that he has a treaty named after him, or that he served as the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. But did you know that Jay also served as the first minister to Spain, or that he helped negotiate the end of the war for American independence? Today, we explore the life and contributions of John Jay with Rob Haberman, an associate editor at the Selected Papers of John Jay Documentary Editing Project. During our conversation, Rob reveals who John Jay was and where his family came from, how Jay became involved with the American Revolution, and why he decided to support the Patriot cause, and Jay's role in the ratification debate over the United States Constitution of 1787. Are you ready to investigate the life and legacy of John Jay? I am. Let's go meet our guest expert. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, Here is this week's special guest. Today's guest is an historian of early America who specializes in politics, periodicals, and media in New York and the New Nation. He is also an associate editor of the Selected Papers of John Jay, a documentary editing project located at Columbia University. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Rob Haberman. Hi, thanks for having me. John Jay. He's one of those founders that we all know his name when someone else mentions it. However, he's not what I would consider a top-of-mind founding father for most Americans. Would you agree with this impression, Rob, or do you have different insight? Oh, definitely. I think that most of the general public and even some scholars aren't as familiar with John Jay and his many contributions to America in the revolutionary and early national period. Well, let's see if we can change that in doing today's interview. Would you provide us with a brief overview of who John Jay was and his accomplishments? Sure. So Jay was born in 1745 to a wealthy mercantile family in New York. He entered King's College in New York City in 1760 which is, of course, today's Columbia University, and he completed his studies four years later. He then joined the New York City Bar and practiced as a lawyer. Like many of his generation, Jay's life was completely transformed by the American Revolution. Indeed, Jay's major diplomatic, civic, and political achievements occurred within the time frame of the Revolutionary Era, roughly from, say, 1774 to 1799. So here's a list of the highlights of Jay's accomplishments. He was a delegate to the First and Second Continental Congresses and served as president of that body in 1779. He was a member of New York's Provincial Congress and helped to draft the state's first constitution in 1777. He further served New York by establishing the state's judicial system and becoming its first chief justice. He then embarked on a diplomatic career and was appointed minister to Spain in 1779 with the goal of gaining recognition funding, and support in the conflict against Britain. Jay then joined the diplomatic team that negotiated the American Peace Treaty with Britain in 1782-83. Upon returning home, Jay was appointed by Congress as Secretary of Foreign Affairs, a post he held from 1784 to 1789, and he was then a leading proponent of constitutional reform. So he joins Madison and Hamilton in writing the Federalist Essays, 
and skillfully argues for New York's ratification of the U.S. Constitution in the 1788 State Convention. And in the new national government, he served as the first Chief Justice of the United States from 1789 to 94 and helped establish the tone and authority of the nation's judiciary. Jay is then recalled to the diplomatic realm, and he sails to London to sign the famous and controversial treaty that bears his name. The Jay Treaty of 1794 was intended to create a lasting peace between Britain and the United States and to resolve the issues that had been plaguing the two nations since the Treaty of 1783. Jay returns home in 1795 and begins the last spell of his public service career. He's elected twice as governor of New York from 1795-99, and during these years, he oversees the state during the quasi-war with France, yellow fever outbreaks, and he signs a law that introduces gradual abolition of slavery in 1799. He then lives out the rest of his life in retirement, farming his estate in Bedford until his death in 1829. And let me add that besides his career as a statesman, Jay was active during his adult life in anti-slavery campaigning, in moral and religious reform, in agricultural improvement, and he also had an amazing relationship with his family as husband to Sarah Livingston Jay and father to his six surviving children, plus his adopted nephew. Wow. A Continental Congressman, a diplomat, a chief justice, governor of New York, reformer and family man. He did it all. Yeah, we really need to remember this guy. And there's so much material for us to dig into here. Let's start with his early family history. I understand that Jay is descended from French Huguenots who settled in New York after 1685. Would you tell us about the Jay family and their fellow Huguenots and really why those Huguenots settled in North America? Well, Jay's grandfather, Augustus, was a well-off merchant who lived in La Rochelle, France. And he was forced into exile along with his family in 1685 because of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. This, of course, is a famous proclamation ensuring religious toleration for Protestants or Huguenots living in France, where Catholicism was predominant in that country and embraced by the monarchy. So eventually, Augustus makes his way to New York which, like Charleston and Philadelphia, boasted a growing Huguenot community. And Augustus thrives in the city as a merchant. He engages in transatlantic trade. And just as importantly, he marries well. His wife's family, the Bairds, they are politically and socially connected. And they are wealthy in their own right. And let me add here that Jay's family's background is not just Huguenot, it's also Dutch. And Jay's Dutch relations rank among the most prominent families of New York. So they include families like the Van Cortlands, the Van Rensselaers, the Schuylers. And these Dutch connections also help explain his family's prominent social status, their financial well-being, as well as Jay's own political influence. You really have mentioned the who's who of Dutch New York, the Schuylers, Von Rensselaers, <laughs> and Von Cortlands. So I didn't realize he was that well connected. And what's also remarkable is many of those families end up supporting the American Revolution. Would you tell us how Jay became involved in the American Revolution and whether his decision to become a patriot was an easy one for him to make? Because he lived near New York City or in New York City, and, and that place was fraught with people deciding whether or not to become a patriot or a remain a loyalist. Yeah, indeed. And it's interesting because many of Jay's closest friends do, in fact, become loyalists. And many scholars have asked, and many historians have asked, so why doesn't Jay take this route? Why does he become a patriot instead of a loyalist? So up to late 1773, Jay is largely apolitical. 
he first gets involved with the Patriot resistance in the aftermath of the so-called intolerable acts. So Jay is horrified by the events in Boston, and he's concerned that the economic punishment inflicted on the city and the dissolution of representative government in Massachusetts, that this represents not only a threat to Boston and Massachusetts, but it's a threat to colonial liberties and rights throughout the colonies. So this is really the reason for him going over to the Whig or the Patriot cause. Nonetheless, Jay has been called a moderate revolutionary. And this is the fair assessment of him, for he is counseling moderation and reconciliation as a response to the imperial crisis. He believes, and this is, you know, up through, say, late 1775, he believes that the king and parliament are misinformed and have miscalculated their policies. And for Jay, it's interesting because prudence is his watchword. Prudence defines his approach to politics. Indeed, prudence defines his approach to life itself. So it comes as little surprise then that Jay is part of the congressional committee that draws up the Olive Branch petition in July 1775. So Jay then is seeking a peaceful resolution to the growing conflict between British government and the colonies. And we can say that Jay then is he's practically the opposite of a firebrand like Samuel Adams, who is espousing independence and who's well known for his radical rhetoric. Now, Jay eventually does come to embrace the cause of independence, but it's a gradual process and it involves much soul searching on his part. Jay was not in Philadelphia when the vote was taken in early July to support independence. At this time, he had returned to New York because of family illness, and he remains in New York and becomes heavily involved in provincial politics there. Even though he is away from Philadelphia, he embraces independence once it has been endorsed by Congress. And by this time, Jay is disappointed that the British government has done next to nothing to address what he sees are the legitimate grievances of the colonists. Moreover, Jay recognizes that the extent of the military conflict and what he viewed as cruelty on the part of the British, that these circumstances ended any possibility for reconciliation with Britain. So Jay returns home to New York for family reasons. So he misses the vote for independence. And of course, the only reason there was a unanimous vote for independence is because New York abstains from the vote. Um, so it seems like his moderate politics actually represent his state fairly well. But I wonder, did New York replace him on the committee or did he just didn't go? You know, I have to look into that. I honestly don't know at this point whether he was replaced with another delegate. Why does the Continental Congress select John Jay to serve as its minister to Spain in 1779? Would you tell us, you know, what qualified him for that position and and perhaps about his diplomatic missions and experiences in Europe? Sure. So Jay was chosen to head a mission to Spain because of his experience serving on congressional committees that dealt with foreign affairs and specifically America's policies towards Spain. Jay's actual experience in Spain, however, was marked largely by disappointment, both in terms of his living arrangement and in terms of achieving his diplomatic goals. Jay's wife, Sarah, and his nephew, Peter J. Monroe, accompany him on the trip. So it's nice that he has family going with him. But other than that, it's a horrible trip. It goes badly from the start. Shortly after leaving in October 1779 on a continental frigate named the Confederacy, the ship almost founders in a storm and has to sail to Martinique for repairs. In Martinique, 
Jay finds another vessel that will take him to Europe. Unfortunately, things don't improve for the Jays once they arrive in Spain. They really have a miserable time. The travel on coaches are very uncomfortable. They get overcharged in hotels. So, for instance, Jay tells an anecdote where he's charged for 14 rooms where he stayed at an inn. And he asked the landlord, he goes, what are you doing? Why are you charging me so much? I, you know, we only rented out one or two rooms. And the landlord says, well, there were 14 beds in your room, so therefore I have to charge you for 14 rooms. Moreover, his accommodation in these hotels, they are pretty dirty. And Jay complains, and I quote, that there were no less than two or 3,000 fleas, lice, and bugs. And as a New Yorker, fellow New Yorker, I can appreciate Jay's concerns there. Jay is also, he's in the embarrassing situation where he's running out of money. And he has to write off to Benjamin Franklin in Paris to arrange for loans from the French to see him through. Jay is also, he's not fond of courtly life in Spain. It's too aristocratic and luxurious for his taste. And then to make matters worse, a personal tragedy strikes the family. Sally, at this time, is pregnant, and she gives birth to a daughter in Madrid, and unfortunately, their baby die soon thereafter in the summer of 1780. Diplomatically, the mission is a near fiasco. Jay arrived in Spain in early 1780, and he spent the next two and a half years there in negotiations. Congress wanted him to gain uh, Spanish recognition of the United States as an independent and sovereign nation Congress also wanted to form a military alliance with Spain, and it wanted funding for the war effort. Jay does not succeed in these efforts. And to add insult to injury, Jay is not even recognized by the Spanish authorities as an accredited diplomat. Jay is also experiencing problems with his assistants, William Carmichael and Brockholst Livingston and Livingston is his brother-in-law. These men are serving as Jay's secretaries, but they end up, they're, they're not following his instructions. They're more interested in partying and spending money than they are than in attending to their work. So Jay is probably not disappointed when he leaves Spain for Paris as one of the American peace commissioners who will negotiate with Britain. And here the situation is different. Jay strikes up a friendship with Franklin. They become quite close. They often play chess together. And as one of the lead negotiators alongside Adams and Franklin, Jay is far more successful in his doings than he was in Spain. Although not perfect, most of his contemporaries view the peace treaty in positive terms. After all, the two most important treaty provisions are that Britain will now formally recognize the United States as an independent and sovereign nation, and that the territory of a new nation has almost doubled. Its western borders now reach the Mississippi River. In episode 37, Kathleen Duval discussed how the Spanish participated in the American Revolution. And I wonder if the chilly reception or near disastrous reception that Jay met with had to do with the fact that the Spanish were actually reluctant to enter the war, you know, which was trying to overthrow a monarch or whether perhaps maybe there was some language barrier. I mean, was Jay fluent in Spanish? No, I don't believe so. I need to check with my colleagues, but I have not seen evidence that his knowledge of Spanish was anywhere near fluent. From what I've read, it was a matter of Spain is concerned that the United States is indeed overthrowing a monarchy, 
And the last thing that Spain wants is its own colonies to catch wind of this revolutionary fervor and rid themselves of Madrid. So what Spain is ultimately doing is it's still fighting against Britain, but more or less it's, I think, a parallel war rather than a coordinated supporting effort with the United States. Jay helps negotiate the Treaty of Paris of 1783, which ends the American Revolution, gets the United States its independence. And then he returns home and becomes active in trying to get the United States Constitution ratified between 1787 and 1789. Could you tell us how John Jay became active in the Federalist Papers? And perhaps while you're discussing this, you could also remind us what the Federalist Papers were and what role they played in the ratification of the Constitution. Yeah. So in the aftermath of the War of Independence, Americans disagreed on how their government should be organized. Some favored the existing Articles of Confederation, and that was the system that had been put in place in 1777. And these Articles placed much of the power in the hands of the individual states. So, for instance, under this arrangement, the central government had no power of taxation and it could not oversee foreign trade. Now, Jay's experience as president of the Continental Congress had convinced him that only a strong centralized government with a strong executive and an independent judiciary would ensure the security, prosperity, and the continued existence of the United States. He therefore supported the adoption of a new system of governance as drawn up in the Constitution of 1787. And those who shared his views are known as Federalists. Those who opposed this vision of the new nation for various reasons, well, they become known as Anti-Federalists. And the Anti-Federalists, their fear is that a national government is going to act like a monarchy. And the United States had just overthrown, well, not overthrown, but, you know, they were now free from uh, the tyranny of King George III. So the anti-federalists, they're afraid that, you know, this new executive, this could be just uh, like a British monarch and would seek to deprive the people of their individual rights and liberties. So... In terms of adopting the Constitution and ratifying the Constitution so that it becomes the law of the land, the Federalists, like Jay, they're really facing an uphill battle. And the Constitution has been drawn up in Philadelphia in September 1787. Now it has to be ratified in individual state conventions. So in New York... Most of the delegates who are attending the state convention in Poughkeepsie, the vast majority of them are anti-federalists. They oppose the Constitution. So to sway the populace and the delegates to favor its adoption, Jay, along with Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, outline their arguments favoring the Constitution in a series of essays known as the Federalist Papers. Jay authors five of the 85 essays, so he is responsible for numbers two through five and 64. And Jay would undoubtedly have written more, but for the fact that he was injured in a popular disturbance. And this is known as the Doctor's Riot. This event occurs in April, 1788, when New Yorkers are suspicious that local physicians are having cadavers dug up, and then the doctors are using them for dissection. So this really stirs up the crowd in New York. The doctors have to be put into jail for their own safety, but they are still threatened by a hostile population. Jay gets wind of this, And he shows up at the jail. He has his sword in hand, and he tries to disperse the people. 
and things get even uglier real fast. He is struck in the head with a rock, and Jay falls unconscious, and it takes him several weeks to fully recuperate. Now, having said this, I also want to point out that in addition to the Federalist essays, Jay writes a very influential paper that is not widely known by many people today. This is his anonymous pamphlet addressed to the people of the state of New York, in which Jay is arguing in favor of the Constitution. This piece is intended for a general audience and proves very influential in convincing those who are undecided and even some anti-federalists who had previously opposed the Constitution's ratification. Chris, Michael, and Alec would like to know about the Jay Treaty of 1795. Would you tell us what the Jay Treaty was and why it met with such a mixed reception from both Congress and the American people? So the treaty signed with Britain in 1783, this treaty has left many matters undecided. So most notably, the issues that still needed to be settled included determining the northern boundary, that is, the United States and Canadian boundary. What about the continued presence of British troops and British forts in the Northwest Territory? The Americans wanted to open up the British West Indian trade, which would be very lucrative for their merchants and for their shipping. And there was also issues of American vessels are being seized on the ocean by the British And there's the impressment of American sailors, and the list goes on. So this situation is so tense between Britain and the United States that war seemed a very likely consequence if they did not resolve these longstanding problems. Jay, who was such a key figure in the first treaty with Britain, was again tapped to negotiate on behalf of his country and he sails off to London in May 1794. Now, the terms that Jay ultimately agrees to with his British counterparts, they're far from perfect, but they do resolve some of the most pressing problems. The British evacuate the posts on the Great Lakes. Both sides agree to settle their wartime debts, and the boundary issue with Canada is sent into arbitration. So many Federalists do support the treaty, and it is ratified by the Senate, and Washington, as president, signs it into law. However, the treaty has a polarizing impact on the nation, which now feels torn between Britain and France. Jefferson and Madison view the treaty as a betrayal to France, which had been America's longtime ally. And France had just experienced its own revolution and was also at war with Britain. So, in fact, the split over the treaty, it's so divisive that it leads to the first party system in the United States. This is where you have the formation of the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Many opponents, the way they perceive the treaty, it's that, well, Jay has been outmaneuvered by his British colleagues, or that, even worse, Jay had purposely shifted American foreign and commercial policy away from their longstanding ally friends in favor of Britain. So you see in the press during this time, the newspapers are full of poems and songs lambasting Jay. In addition, there are street demonstrations and public protests damning the treaty. And this is the source of Jay's reported famous observation that he could travel at night from Boston to Philadelphia solely by the light of his burning effigies. I have never really thought of the Jay Treaty as the event that caused the first party system. I mean, I I know that the first party system evolves. I know what their political issues are, but I guess it makes sense that it's the Jay Treaty because that did produce a lot of vitriol and, and discourse in the newspapers and among the public. We've talked a lot about John Jay's accomplishments. 
Why do you think it is that so few Americans remember John Jay, given the number of accomplishments that he's had and the contributions he made towards the founding of our nation? Do you think it's because he never became president? Well, you know, after decades of public service, Jay is, Jay, he's ready to retire in 1799. He had sacrificed so much in the period of the revolution that now all he wants to do is retire to his farm in Bedford. He just wants to spend time with his family. He's not interested in seeking any more public offices, let alone the presidency. And I think Jay and his contributions remain largely unknown to the public, I think for two reasons. First, for a long time, scholars have lacked access to his personal papers. His personal papers were largely controlled by his descendants. And up until a few decades ago, only older, incomplete edition that had been completed in the 1800s, these were really the only collection of J documents that were in existence. And second, Although Jay is recognized or was recognized by contemporaries as possessing a sound judgment, uh, he was known for his diligence and his integrity, he's far less dramatic than some of the other founders. So, for instance, he's not a scientist. He's not an inventor like Franklin. He's not killed in a duel in the prime of his life like Hamilton. Um, He's not the skilled military commander like Washington. However, Jay is the one doing much of the daily diplomacy and administrative work and making key decisions that were required to win the revolution and establish the new nation. And I think once this full story, which, you know, might not be so glamorous, but once this full story is told, then I think he will receive more attention and accolades from the American public. Before we move on to the time warp, you mentioned earlier that you're an associate editor with the selected papers of John Jay. Would you tell us about the documentary editing project and why they're the selected papers of John Jay and not the John Jay papers? Sure. This project, which um, started in the early 1990s, We have a fairly small staff, and we are producing seven volumes of the selected papers of John Jay. We would love to do a comprehensive edition. Unfortunately, there are constraints in terms of personnel, funding, time, etc. For instance, we have to cover each of us, my colleagues, Elizabeth Nuxle and Jennifer Steenshorn, and myself, we have to work on different aspects of editing. So on a given day, I might be proofing documents from volume four, but at the same time, I'm transcribing volume five. And then I'm also writing index entries for Jay's diary, which is located in volume five. So we have to cover several different tasks with the documents that we've selected for publication simply to complete the project within the time parameters. We uh, would not be able to do the thousands upon thousands of papers that are part of the John Jay collection. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Rob, in your opinion, what might have happened if John Jay hadn't negotiated the Jay Treaty? How might the history of the United States and Jay's legacy be different today? Well, I really think, and I I can't claim this as an original thought, but based on my reading of the period and uh, Jay's actions and responses 
in the 1790s, I truly think there would have been a war between the United States and Britain that this would have broken out within a couple years of 1794. And that I think it's it's highly doubtful that the United States would have been able to emerge victorious or even emerge intact from such a conflict. I mean, this is the same time that you have the Whiskey Rebellion. You have many Western settlers are looking south, looking west, looking north. And they're thinking, well, maybe we would be better off under British or Spanish rule other than you know, remaining within the United States. So I think there would have been a, uh, a war. And I think even worse that Jay's worst fears would have been realized in that the United States probably would have split up into different confederacies. And that would have basically, that would have been the end of the American nation. And of course, there was a war. It's just the Jade Treaty put it off until 1812. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. Before we conclude, would you tell us how we can access the Jade Papers? Are they just in book form or do you have a digital online edition that we can access as well? Sure. So as I mentioned, there are seven volumes of the selected papers of John Jay. And these are put out by the University of Virginia Press. So... Thus far, we have three volumes that are already out, and a fourth is due out by December of this year. In addition, the J papers are available through a subscription database known as Rotunda, the American Founding Era Collection. And this is a database that is also put out by the University of Virginia. Finally, the public can access original J documents on a free digital database. This is the John J. Papers online collection, which is available through the University of Columbia Library's website. Alec would also like to know if you know of any books about John Jay that are about to come out or if there are any in the works. Yeah, well, um, I'm glad to say there's been a resurgence of Jay scholarship. There's a good general biography on Jay that came out a few years ago by Walter Starr. More recently, Joseph Ellis is exploring Jay's contributions to the creation of the Constitution. This is in Ellis's new book, The Quartet. Another recent publication is Jonathan Den Hartog's Patriotism and Piety. And in this work, Hartog looks at how Jay's Federalist politics intersected with his religious beliefs. And due out soon is a multi-generational biography by David Gelman. And this is entitled Liberty's Legacy. And here Gelman is going to examine the links between the Jay family and slavery across four centuries. Rob, where's the best place to look for more information about you, the selected papers of John Jay, and how to get in contact with you should we still have questions about Jay? Okay, so if you have any questions or comments, please send an email to me or my colleagues, Elizabeth Nuxel and Jennifer Steenshorn. You can send an email to me at rkh2125 at columbia.edu. You can also find out more information on our Facebook page. And our Facebook page is the Selected Papers of John Jay. And finally, we also have a Twitter account. Our handle is at JJ Talking. And I want to spell that out. So that is J, J A Y, and then second word, talking. And on uh, Twitter, we put on Jay's quips and quotes and fun anecdotes. And likewise, we also have some wonderful information on the Facebook page as well. Thank you so much for giving us these book titles and all these ways to contact you and and to access the Jay Papers. Uh, Thanks so much. 
and Rob, thank you so much for helping bring John Jay back to the forefront of our minds. He sounds like a truly fascinating individual, and I'm thankful you could spend your time with us today. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I think it's pretty remarkable that John Jay played such a prominent and important role in the founding of the United States, and yet many of us only remember his name. And I'm guilty of this, too. But as Rob reminded us, John Jay helped draft the Treaty of Paris of 1783, which ended the war for American independence. He helped push his fellow New Yorkers to ratify the United States Constitution, and he helped broker an agreement with England that postponed a war that the young United States could ill afford to wage. John Jay may not be a top-of-the-mind founding father, but it sounds like he should be. You can find more information about Rob, the selected papers of John Jay Documentary Editing Project, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, benfranklinsworld.com slash 055. Now you can also access the show notes by clicking the link located in the episode description in the Ben Franklin's World Android or iOS app. To become a Ben Franklin's World app user, search for Ben Franklin's World in the Apple app or Google Play stores, or visit benfranklinsworld.com slash iOS or benfranklinsworld.com slash Android. Now, if clicking on the link is too much effort, you can also sign up for the Franklin Gazette, which will put the show notes for each week's episode in your inbox. To sign up for the Franklin Gazette, visit benfranklinsworld.com or text BFWorld to 33444. And when you sign up for the Franklin Gazette, you will also receive access to Poor Richard's Club, our private listener community on Facebook. If you love Ben Franklin's World and would like to find out more about how you can help support the show, please visit benfranklinsworld.com slash support or text support BF World to 33444. Phew, man, we have a lot of housekeeping announcements now at the end of every episode. But here we are, we're at the end, and I want to know what you think. What do you think John Jay's most important contribution to the founding of the United States was? And what can we do to help our fellow Americans remember him? Email your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet them to at Liz Covart, post a comment on the show notes page for this episode, or in Poor Richard's Club. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.